supersonic flight is one of the world's ultimate speed highs. But push things too far, and even the most advanced aircraft may not be able to pull back from the edge. On January the 25th, 1966, test pilots Bill Weaver and Jim Zweyer took a Blackbird to three times the speed of sound. At about 24,000 meters up, the right engine died. The dead engine became an anchor, and the good engine kept exerting so much force it ripped the plane apart in mid-air. Zweyer ejected. But before Weaver could eject, he blacked out. The plane broke up around him. I remember thinking to myself, boy, I just had a terrible dream. I hope I wake up pretty soon. That was awful. Thought to myself, God, that wasn't a dream. That really happened. And if that really happened, I must be dead. I thought to myself, gee, being dead isn't so bad. What's everybody worried about? And then I became fully aware, fully conscious, and realized that I wasn't dead, and I had somehow become separated from the airplane and I was still alive. The aircraft literally disintegrated around us, and yet I was literally in good shape. I had a few minor bruises. Looked around and I could see another parachute. First thing I saw, and it was Jim's parachute, and I was so greatly relieved. Weaver came down on a ranch in New Mexico. Here's this guy coming toward me with a cowboy hat. He said, well, I saw your buddy come down. I'm gonna go over and see, see if I can help him. Came back about 10 minutes later with the devastating news that Jim was dead. He had not made it. Jim Zweyer's death confirmed the ultimate risk of supersonic flight. Ejection at supersonic speeds. If for some reason you find it necessary to leave the creature comforts, if you will, of the cockpit, and now you've pulled that ejection handle, you've just opened a whole nother can of worms. Lieutenant Commander Matt Hebert trains pilots for one of the most dangerous maneuvers of supersonic flight. Ejection. The decision to eject has to be second nature. Because the aircraft is traveling at such a high rate of speed in most cases, there are split seconds, literally, that are survival or not survival. Essential in this vital maneuver, keeping still, head up, back straight, limbs in. If you're out of the proper body position for this ejection seat, you're likely to end up with some cervical or some neck injuries as, as you pull that handle. One danger is spinal compression. The force is so strong that pilots have ended up a few centimeters shorter after ejecting. The trainer exerts only two Gs on the body, one-tenth of the force of a real ejection. The pilot may experience 20 plus G's as he goes up the rails, but it's only for a second, second and a half. The ejection sequence happens that fast. The problems don't go away when their decision to eject kicks in. The next thing that he'll face is a wind blast once he gets out into the airstream. At supersonic speeds, hitting a blast of wind can be like hitting a concrete wall. At extreme speeds, and that would exceed right around five, 600 knots, you're going to be injured, some, some type of bodily injury. The engineers at Patuxent River know just what kind of injury a pilot could endure. If you can imagine yourself sticking your hands and face outside of your car window going about 600 miles an hour, that's kind of what we test here. The engineers can simulate winds of over 1,000 kilometers an hour and test the effects on both the dummy and the equipment. If that stuff catches the wind stream, uh, what could happen is the force of that can cause the helmet to come off, put a lot of strain on the neck and, and cause the neck to break. If we develop a new radio, a new survival vest, a new uh, life preserver, a new helmet, we verify that it's not going to cause any problems during the ejection. Today, they're testing a new helmet. 
These mannequins are designed to withstand these types of tests over and over. The, the human's not. But our instrumentation that we mount inside these mannequins can tell us what forces, what accelerations the human is seeing. The test is captured on high-speed cameras that operate at 1,000 frames a second. All right, Haley, go ahead, bring up pressure. Now, the instant replay. We rigged the test so that the head is in a downward position when we start. And you can see the head gets slammed into the head pad, but where it gets worse is when this head gets twisted, turned down. That is something that we don't like to see when we do these types of tests. In a real ejection, the pilot would have broken his neck. But that's why we do these tests. Better do it on the mannequin than see this in real life. But even the most authentic simulation can't completely prepare pilots for reality. At these speeds, any maneuver can quickly become a dangerous mishap. Recoveries are rare. In a pilot's worst nightmare, he's out of control and heading towards the ground. There's only one option. The pilot sits on a pyrotechnic catapult. He ejects with a 20G blast. In less than two seconds, he's heading towards safety. Supersonic ejection is so dangerous, only a handful of pilots have done it and lived to tell the tale. Their survival is more than a spectacular story. It's a miracle. This plant builds what every military aviator hopes he'll never have to use. Ejection seats. The Air, Force does the, the boom. Air Force pilot Brian Udell had to use his while traveling at supersonic speeds. The speed at which Dennis and I went out, neither one of us uh, should have lived. The seats had never even been tested at that speed. April the 18th, 1995. During a night training mission off the coast of North Carolina, Udell began a routine turn. About 110, 100 degrees through the turn or so is when things went from good to not good. My first indication that, that we even had a problem was I started hearing wind rushing over the canopy. I started flying at a very young age. My father uh, is who taught me, and he, uh, he said, always trust your instruments, but always listen to the airplane because it will talk to you. And this airplane was definitely talking. But in the pitch black sky, his airplane was telling him two stories. His main display showed him at 7,300 meters, making a right-hand turn. But a backup instrument showed him at just over 5,000 meters and heading straight for the ground. His speed was over 300 meters per second. From 17,000 feet to 10,000 feet went by in just over five seconds. I always briefed and used 10,000 feet as an out of control ejection altitude. That was, at the, that was the, the, the point in space that if I don't have control of this airplane, it's time to get out. I got in a body position, commanded the bailout, and pulled the handles. Basically, bailout, 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 go. In that time frame, 4,000 feet went by. The canopy blew off at 4,500 feet. Dennis went out at 3,000 feet. I left the cockpit at 1,500 feet, got my parachute about 500 feet above the water. Had I waited even a half a second longer to pull the ejection handles through the sequence of events, I would have hit the water still in my seat. The wind killed his passenger, Dennis White, instantly. The uh, wind blast uh, at 800 miles an hour, which is about the speed at which we went out, uh, stops becoming wind and basically starts becoming a freight train. It immediately ripped my helmet mask right off my head. It broke all the blood vessels in my head and face. My head was literally swollen the size of a basketball. Lips were the size of cucumbers. So there's metal bayonets that clip into the helmet. Both of those gouged right up my face, took nice uh, chunks of skin right out. My left arm blew out and into the wind stream. And when it did, it dislocated my elbow, blew my arm backwards, and it tore the muscle across my chest. There's retaining bars down here on either side of the seat. They're supposed to keep your legs within the confines of the seat. Well, at this speed, it took those bars and bent them straight out. Now my leg goes out into the wind stream and starts whipping. 
The only thing holding my right leg on at the knee joint was the artery, the vein, the nerve, and the skin. That was it. It was pitch black. I could hear the parachute ruffling above me. I could feel the cold night air on my face, and I knew I had to get busy. My life preserver had never been tested at that speed and shredded, looked like rags hanging around my neck. Now I'm getting concerned. I'm going into the ocean, and I'm hoping my life raft doesn't look like my life preserver. It didn't. After drifting and shivering for four hours, gravely injured, Udell was rescued by the Coast Guard. I owe my life to the people that, that, uh, that make this seat. He was told he might never walk normally again let alone fly. Ten months after his bailout, he was back flying F-15s. Supersonic flight must truly be the ultimate high, because even pilots who have flirted with disaster still come back for another fix. I have an airplane and I fly a couple hundred hours a year. The airplanes are somewhat like young ladies. They, they, they draw your attention. It's still a thrill but not like the old days when the sound barrier was not yet breached. That thrill is gone. It was the golden era, the golden age. There, there's no X-15s today. There's no exotic flying machine to test today. People today don't have the near as much fun, near as much adventure as we had back in, the, in our heyday. Oh, to be 80 again. But for speed freaks, going supersonic will always be the world's most extreme ride.